First, we're going to cover the fluoroscope. The first part is this input phosphor. It's made of cesium iodide. It receives the x-rays that come from the patient and produces light. So the x-rays are coming into the fluoroscope here and they hit this input phosphor and it's glowing. It's giving off light. Behind that you can see that there's this photocathode which picks up the light and turns it into electrons which are then accelerated towards this anode. Uh, it's similar to an x-ray tube but instead of striking the anode they strike the output phosphor. This whole concept is similar to the human eye. So in the human eye we have the lens, right, and it uh, flips the light upside down in order to focus it on the nerves in the back of the eye and it's uh, turned right side up in your brain. Uh, the fluoro kind of works the same way. So next we have these uh, electrostatic lenses that uh, focuses uh, those electrons. It pushes them to a focal point. Uh, this is where the uh, brightness gain is taking place. Uh, this is where uh, the, the money meets the road here in the fluoroscopy. Um, the next part is the, the anode. It's accelerating, but remember these electrons, they don't strike the anode, they pass by it. And they strike this output phosphor at the end, and it produces light again. Uh, this light is 50 to 75 times more than the light you started with. So really it's uh, x-rays produce the light, uh, light produces the electrons, and electrons produce light again. So you ask yourself, well, why do it, does this whole thing need to produce electrons? If you have light coming in and you have light going out, uh, what's the reason for everything in the middle there? Uh, and the purpose is, is to increase the brightness, the, the signal from the patient. Uh, you need to increase the brightness in fluoroscopy. Next I want to talk about frames per second and how many frames do you use and what's causing uh, more radiation to the patient and what's giving better detail. Uh, picture the old school flip books that you used to have as a kid and basically how cartoons are made. Uh, each one of those pages uh, consider that to be a, an actual exposure, an actual x-ray. So when you set your fluoroscopy machine on three frames per second it's taking three images, three exposures per second. If it's on uh, nine frames per second, it's taking uh, nine images per second, so nine exposures to, to the patient per second. So you can see as you increase your frames per second, it is increasing the patient dose, right? You're getting more exposure. Uh, but also you are increasing the detail. If you have a flip book with only three pictures in it, uh, the quality is definitely not going to be as good as a uh, flip book that has, you know, nine pages per second. So yeah, there, there is better detail, uh, but there is more exposure to the patient. So uh, where I've worked, we typically use three frames per second for fluoro cases with barium and things like that. But some angio cases and some special cases, maybe in the OR, they would you could increase the uh, frame rate to, you know, uh, six to eight frames per second. Some other things to consider when doing fluoro, remember the x-ray tube is below the patient. So if you are still at a facility that's going to shield the patient, don't place the shield on the patient's lap. Place it underneath them. Um, you could possibly do this for uh, pediatric patients when you're doing barren swallows or things that are not looking into the intestines. Uh, but also notice if the fluoro machine has the x-ray tube at the bottom, that means the image intensifier is at top. Uh, this is your IR. If you think about it with the terms of OID and all the factors you learn with image critique and receptor exposure and magnification and detail and distortion and all that, uh, having the image intensifier above the patient, uh, you, if you had control, would want to have that Im image intensifier as close to the patient as possible. Uh, this will create the, the least magnification, the least OID. If you raise that up, um, possibly when you do arthrograms and the doctor has uh, you know, needles and syringes and things uh, in there uh, you know, causing the distance, um, that's causing magnification, uh, distortion, uh, less detail. 
Um, that's what we consider bad mag. So uh, the best picture possible, you can't really change the distance of the tube itself. It's fixed under the table. Uh, however, you can uh, lower the intensifier down uh, when possible to decrease the patient dose and also decrease magnification. So now let's talk about where is the best place to stand. I remember uh, Dennis Bowman, uh, the digital guru from California at a particular seminar uh, selling these DVDs and we purchased one with our uh, school and it uh, did an experiment where they uh, test the uh, the doses that you get and, and at the different particular places of where you stand. Um, always the best place to stand is going to be always behind the radiologist, right? Um, let him act as your human shield, as, as uh, human lead is you also have lead on and he should have lead on, so that's the best place to stand. Uh, but other than that, the best place to stand is going to be at the foot of the patient. Um, if you have uh, possibly you know, two techs in the room and you're working with a baby or an elderly lady uh, or a gentleman and you are helping move the patient, um, you always want to stand uh, at the, behind the radiologist or uh, at the foot. Uh, because at the head, you are getting 1.5 times greater dosage than you are at the foot. So remember that. Um, at 90 degrees uh, with no lead, it's 3.5 times greater than at the foot. So always stand behind the radiologist if possible.